to do. All right, hit it, Mallory. All right, that was really good, but there, we got more people on Skype than in here, not really, but almost. Why don't you come up here and read it? Um, to go through the life of First Peter or life of Peter and find the seminal or primary events that happened to him that you think helped him form his view in First Peter, be prepared to read conclusions. All right. Well, I'll tell you how prepared I am for you to do something tonight, and that is, I am prepared. Literally, if anyone feels like they have got it, you've got the thing that it's about, then I invite you to share that tonight. And um, just a couple of things, reminders, even if we don't do that tonight. Um, we will, there will come a time when we need to say that before I share it. <clears throat> but um, I know the Lord is speaking to you. But you, you do have to realize that um, the Lord can show you many different things in any book, and it be of God, okay? There's no, in that sense, there's no wrong answer as long as you're searching for the Lord and you're trying to find out what, what that book is about, then praise God, share what you got, share what you think that it could possibly be, and, um, and we'll be fine with it. Um, but I think it would be, you know, I'm just hesitant to move on into really spelling it all out because, as I said, my heart is, is I so desirous that, that you, from the Holy Spirit, would be able to um, receive that and to see it and to um, bless us with, with your angle of that because even if it's the exact same thing, your angle would probably be a little bit different than mine, too, even if it's the exact same thing. Um, so I'm excited to hear some of those things because, you know, everybody has their bents, you know, the ways that they sort of think. And so um, anybody feel tonight maybe to start with that you'd like to just share? You don't have to share a lot or you can share a lot. I don't care. But uh that you'd like to share some uh, of what you're getting from the Lord? Anybody? Okay, why don't you come on up? I'm excited. <laughs> Praise God. I'm just a student. Well, one of the, what I believe to be a pretty important event that, you know, happened with Peter. Uh, and I believe this is where he got the hope. And it was in John 21, starting at 15, and this is after Jesus has resurrected and showed himself to the disciples once, but then left for a little while before he came back again. And in that little while, Peter said to the other disciples, I go a-fishing, which isn't you know, a hobby like uh, many people see it today, but it was his occupation. He was going back to his old ways. After the re he's seen the resurrected Christ, and he's still going back to his old ways, although I'm sure, certain he has learned something because whenever he sees Jesus again, he just dives in the water right after him. But this is whenever they're having dinner on the shore uh, so when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, you know that I love you. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said unto him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, Do you love me? He said unto him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said unto him, Feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He said unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, 
do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, do you love me? And he said unto him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love thee. And Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto you, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked wherever you would. But when you shall be old, you shall stretch forth your hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither you would not go. And this he spake, signifying by what death he should glorify God. I'm just going to... And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. And like in the actual Greek there, it's he, they're using, Peter and Jesus are using two words for love, uh, agape and phileho. Phileho being a more brotherly, friendly love. Agape being a more serious and godly love. And so Jesus, like if we were to paraphrase that and uh, read it as it would actually translate, it would be, Jesus would say unto Peter, Peter, do you have a love for me that's drawn out of you by my preciousness toward you? To which Peter respond, yes, Lord, you know that I love you as a friend. I be feeding my lambs. Then the second time, Peter, do you love me because of my preciousness to you? And the second time, yes, Lord, you know I view, as, I view, view you as a brother. Feed my sheep. Then the third time, Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, am I just a friend to you? And Peter is grieved that third time because the third time Jesus said, am I just your friend? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I can only love you with this love, and I don't know how to love you anything beyond that. And then he responds, feed my lambs. And then he gives him the hope, the hope that you are going to go exactly through what I went through. You are going to, you know, follow into that death and you will learn this love for me this this higher love this love that is more than a friend you know it's the son of god it's your life the very nature that's like flowing through you and he just tells him follow me not like i don't and i don't even feel that's like you know a command it's just a prophecy <laughs> you're going to follow me <laughs> because that's and you know that's where peter would I feel like that's the hope because Peter had the faith throughout all of it. To me, he was just missing that hope of something beyond what he could see in his faith. And so that to me was the seminal moment. Do you have a, a place other than just the mention of the word hope where you feel like in, in uh, First Peter maybe a verse or something sort of really nails that? Uh, in First Peter... Uh, let me go back there. Yeah, I know you mentioned the hope, and of course, there's plenty of those verses. Uh, the other thing I figured is whenever he's talking to the uh, talking to the church scattered abroad, he talks about brotherly love, which is that same word for leho. But when he talks about whenever we love God, he says, "Whom not, having not seen, you love," and that's that word agape. It's like having not. You know, this isn't a love based on sight. You can't love him as a brother because he's not, you know, he's not going to be there as a brother. You know, you, you have to love him with this love because. And you're sort of seeing that right there, that's, that's pretty quickly within the first three verses that he's starting to use love and talking about and using the different ver uh, kinds of love. And uh, so from that, you're, you see that this this other place where he was with Jesus and the things that you read, that that's that might have sprung from those times. Yeah. Sure yeah. Just trying to make sure everybody understands that's what you're saying. Okay. That's great. Thank you. All right. Well, and of course, anybody that has anything along of what the homework is that you would like to share, we do want to hear it. And it might give angles 
I mean, that's, that was a really good angle. And they might give angles that can really build on what we're trying to get from the Lord, too. So anybody else? Mallory? I had the same passage as brother over here, but um, um, I took a little bit of a different angle with it because I put it in the framework of his complete failure and list of failures on the night of the crucifixion and then looked at that passage in light of everything that Peter had done um, on the night of the crucifixion. So I just wrote this little list down without making all the references. Um, um, on the night of the crucifixion, Peter argued with the other disciples over at the Last Supper as to who would be the greatest. He refused to let Jesus wash his feet. And then when Jesus said he had to, he said, well, wash everything. Like he was completely out of tune on that whole thing, completely. Um, he promised to lay down his life for the Lord, and the Lord's like, no. Um, he fell asleep while Jesus was praying in Gethsemane. He cut off Malchus's ear when they came and arrested him. And then he forsook Jesus with the other disciples and fled. And then he denied him three times. So that all happened within a few hours, like all of that. And so um, I was meditating on that as one, that's seven things. And so that's a complete failure. Like he so isn't Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Like it's seven separate ways of failing the Lord. And, you know. seven against us? <laughs> But so within that, because he genuinely does, he did love the Lord. And just if you, you know, searching his life, how he, you know, was so affected by the Lord after Jesus used his boat, you know, and then blessed him and just so affected by the Lord, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. So he had this tender heart for the Lord and wanted to be all that God wanted him to be. He really, really, I think, I think he did. And so he's devastated. He goes out and weeps bitterly. And as far as he's concerned, that's the end of everything that the Lord has planned for him. He's ruined everything he's ruined everything and the first words Jesus has for him is do you love me feed my sheep and after all of that he says this death that he, he says you're going to go where you know he read it already but you're going to go where you don't want to go and whatnot signifying the death he was going to die and so after a complete failure at the same time seeing Jesus or knowing that Jesus died a perfect death um, Jesus asked Peter to feed his sheep and foretold that he would lay down his life for the Lord. It must have turned his life around completely when Jesus laid out a beautiful future full of the spirit of Christ in which he would lay down his life for others and lead others to do so. And so there you have the cycle happening to him, you know, in the midst of it. So, so you, you feel like um, that, that, that those two, is that the, two, the one that he mentioned also? Mm -hmm. and then than the uh, uh, one there where he denied the Lord, that those are, um, those are pretty much the basis of what First Peter is about. I don't know because I'm not finished searching. Okay. It just seemed to me that this passage in context of his own sense of defeat and failure right. would have been incredibly powerful because he had no hope for himself and Jesus treats him like he's somebody he's not because he's not that yet but Jesus is laying it out and he knows it's tied to the death, burial, and resurrection but maybe he doesn't really know how yet right. you know, so kind of like we don't know how yeah. to tie it in with First Peter and what he's, he's saying yet right you know, not exactly. well, and I think you know, I think you're both right on the scriptures uh, who was it? I think Chris was sharing just a little bit with me he said he, said he started going through the his life, and it was pretty much every experience that Peter ever had, you know. Yeah. But, but yeah, those are similar. Yeah. All right. Chris, you want to give it a shot? You don't have to. You know, I have a lot written, but I don't, uh, I think I'm going to just listen okay. today, maybe, but thank you. Shoot, sure. Yeah. I didn't write mine down, but um, <clears throat> looking at um, uh, through the Gospels and through the book of Acts, what could have um, uh, brought Peter to where he was in First, P in First Peter to write that. And uh, I guess I was a little bit uh, overwhelmed, not in a bad way, but overwhelmed looking through the Strongs of how much Peter himself had more 
it shares more personal experiences of Peter than the other disciples. I mean, he, it brings his experience out more than any, I mean, he has countless experiences uh, that did shape him. But the one that I was um, drawn to, um, two of them, in the, one of them was that um, reading through where he denied Jesus three times and I, I believe it means probably exactly what we all face value, what it means. I mean, he just out and out denied Jesus. But in the way that the Spirit of God can deal with all of us as an individuals, we come to a place where I just, I don't know you. And I feel like that part of his denial was, you know, he was so clutched on to Jesus of Nazareth and and everything, that whole thing of following Jesus, that whole thing, that he must have gone into just, I go back fishing, just great despair. You're not who I, I don't know you. You're not who I thought you were, you know, and on every account where I thought, well, I'm going to be there for you and, and everything, he's, he just somehow he gets broke down on the inside. And so I feel like that part of his denial and, and going back was um, had that uh, inside of it where he's also saying, I just really don't know you. And so he, you know, he denied it. it you know, I, um, you, and I'm sure there's probably some anger in there and some frustration and mad at himself and mad at just whatever all what those aren't even the right words but just um just coming to a, a very desperate point uh to say I don't even know you but I think in his heart I felt like the spirit of God was saying that he was going through an experience really realizing I really don't know who you are Jesus and then I um jumped over to Acts where um, he was fill, full of the Holy Spirit and he was, you know, sharing Jesus, Christ and him crucified just throughout the scriptures and just, I mean, he was just full of the, re, you know, of really of who Jesus was and not the Jesus that he knew, I mean, who he'd known, but uh, it was such a great testimony too to be able to he knew the Jesus of the earth, but he also was knowing Jesus eternally. So I felt like that uh, in First Peter, the Spirit, I felt like my conclusion of in First Peter shares that he is more an embodiment of the Spirit of the Lamb um, inside of him, that he was brought through all that, and he was able to write those things. And if we just look at them at, you know, do this or do that, lay aside this, do that, that um, that's just religion or Christianity. But I believe he really had an encounter with the Lord and that he became an embodiment of the spirit of the Lamb. And just as an example, in um, uh, one of the sections, um, with the based on what I did share, in a couple of verses in First Peter, um, it's he's saying, uh, like, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king or the supreme. You know, and he was up with the Sanhedrin. I mean, he was like, this is what it's about. It didn't. He didn't appear like he had a very submissive spirit before the Sanhedrin. You know what I mean? It did not seem like he also... Um, when he was re reviled, reviled not. But I believe that these, the, in these scriptures here in First Peter, it shows a really deep work of the Lord where the spirit of the Lamb was being formed in him for those kind of words to come out of him. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, he's a precious brother, and I'm, I'm waiting to see in Jesus and hear more from him. Amen. Yeah, I, I remember some time back I was 
was before looking at First Peter, and I was <clears throat> just going through some of the, you know, just the Gospels and some of the things that were going on there. And um, <clears throat> I guess I'd been reading for a while, and um, I noticed that, like Deb said, I noticed there were several stories that I'd read across just, you know, just reading and read across and went, wow. Uh, and the thing that I noticed caused me to dig in deeper and really try to look uh, at this interaction between Peter and Jesus. Like you said, the, the, that's the vast majority of them. And what I found was that Jesus was really rude and hard on Peter. I mean, on a I, you, if you don't know that, you should look it up. It's like, are you kidding me? For, you know, just using one example is, is uh, when Jesus was in the garden praying and they came to take, you know, they take, take Jesus. And, you know, Peter pulls out a sword and cuts off Malchus's ear. He doesn't kill him. He doesn't shove a thing into it. But he cuts off his ear. And, and, uh, and these guys have come to kill him. Peter's just trying to protect him. And he doesn't rebuke them. He turns to Peter and he really says, you know, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. And the, even some of the wording, the way that it is, is like, I could just see Peter going, jeez. Oh, I mean, you are Jesus. but <laughs> So many of the things, it was like, this is really, really kind of rough. And what I, one of the thoughts I thought was, um, Lord, if I treated any of our people in this congregation this bad, then you'd be real upset with me. <laughs> so since then, I've just gone ahead and treated you bad. But anyway, um, <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's real good. And you covered a lot of ground, and I, I appreciate that because it means that you were really trying to find and go across the, the spectrum. Okay, anybody else that's... Even something small you can share. Come on up. I was um, thinking about where uh, Paul confronted Peter. Uh, and he talks about it in Galatians. And this is quite a few years. I mean, Peter, Peter has been walking in the Spirit now quite a few years, but there's still something in him, you know, that, um, uh, that old man or that old way, that religion that he was tied to, has still got a grip on him, you know, and everything. And so it doesn't... It doesn't talk about his reaction here, but to me, you know, like after that happened, I would just I would just try to put myself in Peter's place, you know, and because there had to be a conviction there, like because you know later on he talks he, he Peter talks about Paul and says you know his his letters are a little tough, but you need to read them, you know, you need to <laughs> get what it is that he's got, and so so that one to me was like. This is the last straw. I, I can't anymore hang on to anything, you know. And like, like that's the one that maybe really broke him finally, to let go of all the old and to lay a hold of the, not to Jesus of Nazareth, but the Christ who is the head of his body. And, you know, and begin to function uh, uh, Yes, deal with the gifts, but that not being that aspect of the spirit not being the more important thing, but rather, you know, totally grasping the newness of who Christ really was within himself. That's a <clears throat> that's a good one. I mean, uh, finding that outside of the Gospels, and 
it's another, uh, and I'm not necessarily saying, I'm trying not to say too much, but I'm not necessarily saying that that's, that, that the fact that Jesus rebuked him a lot and was kind of rough on him is, is anything per se. Um, but the way that Paul dealt with him there was pretty rough again. And, and I mean, Peter could have said, dude, I walked with him for three and a half years. You saw him on the road to Damascus, you know, like in a cloud, I don't know. But, you know, just for a minute. <laughs> Doesn't take much to really, when you see him, when you really see him, it takes you, it starts the journey. <clears throat> but, you know, um, who was it? Somebody, who I think Mallory was mentioned that, you know, I mean, apparently really did love the Lord because he was, he was trying and he was seeking. Yeah. And, um, um, and uh, in, indeed, uh, when it says that uh, I go fishing, even the original Greek there is that he's saying I'm going back to fishing. That's the actual Greek in uh, word usage there <clears throat> in the grammar. And, and um, uh, it, it's kind of, I mean, tying a couple of what y'all are saying together, it's kind of interesting that he, he sort of did come to a, like I've had it or something there. <clears throat> and then Jesus shows up, you know, where he's fishing. I mean, Jesus could have been a lot of places, you know. But, uh, it's like all the way back in Galilee, you know, <laughs> and the, in the exact spot, you know, hey, we're fishing here, Jesus, you know. But uh, uh, it was still sort of rough on him. Do you love me, you know? Still kind of rough on him. And so then, like, like you said, Robert, then he comes, then after that, I mean, he, he does see Jesus. He shows up in the upper room and, you know, and, um, you know, miracles start happening. Book of Acts, the very first beginning. I mean, I was sharing this with somebody recently. I said, you know, <clears throat> uh, we lay hands on people, or I've noticed that the... <clears throat> The, the, the uh, televangelists, many of them have moved into selling uh, home remedies or whatever, homopathic things to get people healed. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, <clears throat> and I remember seeing that and then kind of reflecting on it and go, and then I, who came to my mind? Peter. And Peter just walked past the sick, and when his shadow went over him, they got healed. <laughs> Dang, try that one. And then the next thought came to my mind was, not even Jesus did that one. <laughs> you know? I was like, you got to be kidding me. So, <clears throat> I mean, he had, a, he had a good start once he started. Once he got going, he had a good start. But... But like you said, Robert, down the road, down, he was down the road when that thing happened when he came to Antioch. Uh, Where's that scripture? At? <clears throat> yeah, and Galatians too. I mean, he's he, Paul's going. You know, having begun in the spirit, are you made? You know, and all. He, there are several things that I think are kind of pointed yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, he is. And he's saying some pretty rough things uh, before ver verse you know, 20 there, you know. <clears throat> um, because it uh, feels a little bit like jabs at, at Peter, you know. And, um, but then you think about it, and, uh, and I'm particularly moved by all these things. Was this somebody's notes, by the way? I don't want to steal them. Okay. Um, Moved by the fact that, um, you know, from start to finish, I see what Peter's trying to communicate. And it's, it's, just, it's just marvelous, 
It's just marvelous. And um, so anybody else? Just even one story, then you want to comment? Come on, Lindsay. Um, there were several places, um, when I was reading first Peter, where I just felt like he was watching the trial, like Jesus's trial and like his, his betrayal and, and like just even remembering the disconnect that had been there, like what's going on, you know? And so the, in first Peter, when he says, Unto you, therefore, who believe, he is precious. But unto them who are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them who stumble at the word. And I felt like he was, like he's talking about himself in the stone of stumbling, because when Jesus told them he was going to go, that he had to die. Peter said, not so, Lord. Like, that was the word that he stumbled at, was the word of Christ and him crucified, was the word of, that was the word that caused him to stumble, and that was the word that he was offended with. That was where he, like, that was where the breakdown came for Peter. Um, And then when he says, um, having your behavior, so that was like him, where he's remembering that, him stumbling on that point and then and a few verses later he says having your conversation honest among the gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evildoers they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify glorify god in the day of visitation and and i for and the next verse is submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors. And I don't fully, I don't like fully see it, but I just feel like he's seeing Jesus standing and not opening his mouth, being accused as an evildoer, but by his good works glorifying God in, in, in that moment. Like he's being called an evildoer, but he's glorifying God and he's submitting himself to the ordinance of man and to kings and governors. And um, even, the fr- even the phrase in verse 14, for the praise of them that do well, like, I, I don't know, I just always think that's like the, you know, it says, unto governors is unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. And I, I always think that's like, the governors are going to punish the right people and the people who do the right thing are going to be treated okay. And I'm, I'm not saying that that's not the case, but I just wonder if there's something in there that, I don't, that I'm not getting of the governor's punishing evildoers and the praise of them that do well, because he was the one doing well. I'm sorry. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, so ju- just that. And then, can I do a second one really quick? Um, the other one was when he says... Um, of which sal- I feel like he's thinking of the transfiguration when he's talking about the prophets. Because he says, um, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them did signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And in one of the Gospels it says on the Mount of Transfiguration that he and Moses and Elijah are talking about the crew, that he's going to go die. They're not just like chatting. Right. And so, um, and, and then it continues, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us. And so, you know, just with how much he refers back to the law, which came through Moses, and he quotes, um, and obviously, like you said, David, I think he's counting all of them as prophets, because all of it was pointing to Christ and him crucified. And I don't think he's making the division like, the prophets are, are uh, whatever, Isaiah through Malachi, just those guys, right. you know. But he's, like, looking back on the Mount of Transfiguration and remembering the Father, like, overshadowing all of that stuff and being like, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He's like, 
I think all those guys were talking about him. Like, I've come to this conclusion <laughs> that it was always all pointing to him. So anyway, that's all. to hire you back immediately. <laughs> Let's have one comment kind of set from here. Yeah. That, um, like one of the, the other thing I got from Galatians 2 there is that, that Peter needed the Lord now, not when he died. You know, he, he's not thinking about going to heaven or anything like that. He wants the Lord now, you know, yeah. in my Yeah. Uh, just a, a quick question. You asked us for homework also to look at um, suffering. Mm -hmm. Do you have something on that? Well, yeah, but I, I really have a question maybe uh, if you'd be interested in answering. Okay. It. So he's talked about righteousness mm -hmm. and suffering for righteousness sake, and I kind of define that as just, you know, not our righteousness, but his righteousness, right? Because we're in Christ. But right. 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 You know, and just really see what he's mm -hmm. trying to say to that. And so I'm curious, what do you think, or rather, how do you think he's defining righteousness here? Is that, is that a correct assumption to make there? Well, um, uh, most of his terminology that he uses is along one line. And, um, you know, Paul, I mean, my Lord, he's, you know, you, you look at all of the just doctrinal type words that he has and you got to figure them all out and you can just start sinking, you know. But, uh, but Peter's pretty straightforward. He's, he has a, uh, it's tied into a one thing that he's trying to get across. And so... Um, um, within that framework, he's using terminology that Paul would use over here. But it's not wrong. It's just um, when you see what he's saying, you go, yeah, okay. So, so I can't answer that question yet because to do that would, would, would say it, you know. <clears throat> okay, well, let me have a few comments here <clears throat> on what was shared. Um, um, <clears throat> I am, I want to say reasonably sure, but I, I'm, I'm really positive, I'm positive that uh, Peter didn't know the area of reality and the depth of its meaning that he's sharing on in First Peter. He didn't know that back then. He didn't understand it. He, he didn't perceive it. And you know, we do stuff that too. You gotta grow in the Lord and you gotta grow in these things. But, <clears throat> but the specific thing of which he writes about in First Peter, he had no real concept of what that was until, you know, I kind of agree with Robert, probably many, many years after, you know, he was an apostle, you know. Um, uh, so I'm gonna, uh, as usual, I'm gonna comment on some of the, the statements y'all made, and as usual, I'm gonna treat you like Peter, okay? <laughs> um, <clears throat> first of all, um, um, I think that uh, I think that indeed 
Peter wanted um, to be all Jesus wanted him to be. Um, but the failures that he experienced uh, and all the different the different scenarios. Now we we let me before, before I say that we know that God uses all things, right? All things can work together for good. <clears throat> um, but um, all of those failures, specifically, in a certain sense, really don't bring to bear what Peter's dealing with. In First Peter, there is, and and some of you mentioned it, and I think it's one of the easier ones to mention it, but I won't re-mention which one it was yet. But um, uh, it, it's um, it's not really based on failure in general. I'll just say it like that. It's not based on any failures specifically, except maybe one particular area. Uh, he had so many, didn't he? And that's why we could draw from so many examples. But because the Lord has captured him in a certain area, there is there's one specific story that highlights everything that he's trying to say. Everything. <clears throat> And again, that's not saying, you know, other things don't bring to bear in our lives because they do. But Peter's not really, he's really addressing something that happened and what it means to him and to us. <clears throat> um, um, it was said, you know, that Peter said, well, I don't know you and... You're not who I thought you were, and you can become discouraged, uh, and that now he is knowing him eternally. <clears throat> um, this area, yes, I mean, it, it, is, it, it is an eternal truth, but Peter is trying to get us to... to manifest uh, in this particular area. He's not really talking about, well, you know, when any, any time you're in any situation, do this or that or whatever. He's, he, he is really talking about their lives now, their lives. And he's saying, if and when you get in this situation, than so and so. Um, uh, so I, I'd mentioned this earlier uh, in a, one of the early classes, but um, it, it is not about the spirit of the lamb in general. It's just not. It's not. It is not. Uh, just have the spirit of the lamb. <laughs> um, I think it is um, so specific. <clears throat> that Peter knows it's going to require a special whatever. I'll just say it like this. It's going to require a special knowing that he's trying to communicate in his letter of First Peter. It's going to require that, or they're not going to get it. And remember, I said before, you know, he, when he, you know, he didn't get it, Beforehand, he didn't know it. He wasn't aware of it. He he probably wasn't aware of this area until many years of being an apostle. Wow! Think about that. <clears throat> um, now remember, everything I say is on tape, and you can always go back and bring that up once I start sharing this and go, "Oh, you said this." or whatever. Um, hopefully all that I'm saying will stand true, and I think that it will. Um, but I, in fact, let me just say this. I challenge you once that we, we reveal this area and start digging into the scriptures, because there's two things, right? 
revealing what the area is doesn't mean that you really see it or know it yet. Number two, knowing First Peter, right? Because that's, that's the book that he's using to get there. So we have to see him present it, not just me present it. And that's what we're going to do. <clears throat> um, someone mentioned uh, submit yourself to every ordinance. Uh, but, um, but those scriptures and, and really none of them in First Peter are trying to get us to be submissive. In that sense, yeah, in general. It's not that. Um, uh, and, and he, you know, I mean, somebody pointed out one of the other classes that, you know, where he talks about wives submit and then husband. I think it was Dennis pointed that out and then all those things. And yet, we read that as, well, we all need to be submissive. Why, how about Paul? Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands, and da-da-da-da, okay? So we go, okay, well, what do you do? Well, you just submit. <laughs> well, no, that's not, even if, if it sounds just like Paul, it is not Paul. He is not Paul. He is Peter. And he has come through something that has formed him to a T, and it has formed this letter of First Peter to a T, to that thing. And that's why Peter, I mean, Paul, you're out of this. You're, you can't explain this better than Peter because Peter gives him his whole self to it in a letter from start to finish. So, um, um, while it is, and it is true that, that uh, Peter stumbled at Christ crucified and he stumbled big time, right? We all agree with that. He did. He, he stood there before Jesus, you know, and of course it was right after that, 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 um, that Jesus says to, to Peter and to the rest of the guys, uh, you know, um, who, do you, who do you say that I am, right? And... Peter's Johnny on the spot. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And then Jesus, what does he do? He starts be explaining his death and the crucifixion. And he goes into all that that's going to be and everything like that. And then Peter rises up and <laughs> And says, not so, Lord, which you've heard me say many times. You can't say not so and Lord in the same breath. Um, not so, Lord. Um, and he's ready to protect him and do all this kind of stuff. And that, it's in that story that Jesus says, calls him Satan or says, you know, P he says, Peter, get behind me, Satan. Um, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. Well, no matter how wonderful that story is and how true it is that he stumbled at Christ crucified, that's not First Peter. <laughs> that's not what he's writing about. See, And that was the advantage of or disadvantage of just going to anywhere in the scriptures and finding something that had to do with Peter and Jesus or Peter and Paul and whatever. And... Um, we can find things of the Lord. But Peter has, he's come in with a magnifying glass to really get something across. All right. <clears throat> and then, um, uh, of course, uh, you know, all the prophets point to him, and I agree with that too. I mean, I, I agree with everything, but I, I don't agree that that's what First Peter is about. Um, all, you know, the prophets there and the mention of the prophets, and, and this may help you. I'm going to say it. Peter's talking about them in relationship to one thing. One thing. See, 
if I keep saying one thing and then I point to some specific scripture, you should go there and find out what that one thing is that he's talking about. You know what I'm saying? You should go there and just go, well, what is that one thing he's saying? Because he is specifically pointing that the prophets uh, had to do with um, a certain area or had, I'll just say, had interest in a certain area. <clears throat> and, um, but ultimately, it ultimately, really and truly, it doesn't matter if it was Isaiah or David or anyone in First Peter, it doesn't matter. What matters is that in general, he thinks that the prophets had discovered something that was coming. And it wasn't Jesus in the air. <laughs> or, you know, it was something, it was that thing that he's, he's ministering to. And then, um, uh, and then Peter was after Jesus now, and I agree with that. I think that that's, see, I can't disagree with this, but in First Peter, he is not thinking in terms of Jesus now. He's thinking of in terms of Jesus at a certain point or a certain thing. And he's addressing, see, see if, you, if you know the subject that he really is addressing, you know that he, he can't be talking about that now unless that certain thing is here now, okay? But if you listen to him, he's preparing. He's preparing. And again, we're not talking about the second coming. We're not talking about all the things that people would go to, you know what I mean? We're talking about something spiritual that he is trying to prepare us for that he feels uh, is the, I mean, he's, he's given two shots in the, in the New Testament, right? You know, first and second Peter. And he spends one of those shots completely on one subject. So that's how important it is to him. And it must have been important to God. We, have, we must assume that the Holy Spirit moved on him and had him write that letter and write it the way that he did so that these things could come to pack, so, uh, be brought forth and then we could get that thing, that thing. Thank God for Paul. Thank for God for James. Thank God for John. Thank God for all those that, that added to it. But wow, I, I don't know that the Holy Spirit ever came on a person and, and just said, this is it. This is what I want you to do. And, you know, and then give you a book called First Peter and you go, I don't get any of this. You know what I mean? I mean, you could say, you could say I get it if it's all just sort of a nominal Christian view, but it's not. It's not. So anyway, we're getting close. Um, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad for your sakes that Kelly wasn't here. Because <laughs> uh, she tried to share some stuff with me, and I said, "I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it." <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I want us to hear it. If somebody, if somebody feels like you've got it, and that's this is important. This will be the last thing. If you feel like you've got it or at least part of it, or you, because you can get, there are parts to this thing. It's like, it may be one thing, but it has a lot of moving parts. <laughs> so you can get parts of it. And parts are good if you get those parts, because when it comes time to fit those together, it'll be easier if we have two or three parts that people have seen from the Lord themselves, and we fit it into the bigger picture, and it'll go, oh, yeah, of course. Of course, you know, and that's when it's going to be good when we all can start doing this, putting this puzzle together and go, you know, it's like putting this 
this piece of a puzzle right there, you know, and you're, at first it's, I don't know what this is, you know, nobody showed me the picture on the box and this is hard and all this kind of stuff. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, you get to a place where somebody puts a piece in there and we go, of course, of course, it had to be, it has to be. <laughs> There's no other real explanation for it. That's, and that's, that's exactly what happened to me that I didn't know and I felt like I had a, you know, 2,000 piece puzzle that nobody showed me the picture. And then when he started, when he started putting it together. So again, I, I'm ending with, you know, I so long for you to be able to see this. So keep going, don't get discouraged, keep searching, keep, you know, um, uh, and, and don't be afraid to share because um, again, if it's going to, if it's one of those things, if even if it's not the whole, it's it's going to be important, and it'll help all of us. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we we thank you for Peter. Lord, the things that he went through. Lord, the the challenges he faced. But Lord, with all of those things, there was just one point in his life that you brought to bear something so deep for him, something so clear to him, that you thought well of what he saw and had him write a book concerning it in the, in the Bible. And Father, we don't want to, we don't just want me to share it. We don't just, we want to see it from you. And so, Father, we look to you again and again. We say thank you. You are getting us closer. Thank you. Um, the, you're giving us clues that truly are helpful. Help us by the Spirit of God to see Jesus and to give him glory, we ask in his name. Amen.